Thank you, everyone. This is a great pleasure to be here. I got in in time to see the Clinton Library, which I've been dying to see and hadn't actually managed to see it. So actually got to go see the Oval Office, and this time without butterflies in my stomach. I was in that room often, but I was often really nervous to be in that room. <laughs> so um, it's a pleasure to be here. You all have built a wonderful, wonderful complex skip. You should be very proud of, of the school, um, the library. It's, it's just a terrific place, and I do hope to come back and spend a little time in those archives. Uh, in a couple of years. Um, this is a book of stories, uh, stories that tell complex things. And in this, I tell stories of several big time presidential failures, what I call crash and burn failures. I start with the story of the helicopters in the desert that failed to find the hostages in Tehran in 1980. I move to the story of ig ignoring the flashing lights. Um, of course, the first one, by the way, this is my, very much a bipartisan book, so the first one was Jimmy Carter. Second chapter is about the second George Bush, ignoring the flashing lights both before 9-11 before the invasion of Iraq, before the recession and the banking crisis, and with the rescue, with the failed uh, rescue missions after Katrina. Um, the next story is about, I call spacewalks and crashing websites, which is about the Obama administration's failure to launch the healthcare program. And what all of these failures have in common is twofold. First of all, they came right back and whacked the president in the head. There was no way that any of these presidents could talk their way out of these failures. Secondly, the damage done was so significant in, in that in the case of Jimmy Carter, of course, he lost his bid for re-election. In other stories, what happened was the president simply was so politically weakened that he could not fulfill all the other things that he wanted to do, make happen all the other things that he wanted to do. And so the damage was rather big in all these instances. I do not, interestingly enough, include Bill Clinton in my stories. This is not just because I'm a partisan of Bill Clinton. I also don't include Ronald Reagan in these stories. They each had their failures as president. We all, of course, know that Bill Clinton's failures were particularly of a personal nature. Ronald Reagan had failures that were more in the, in the area of a scandal. They just didn't happen to have these particular kinds of failures. These were failures to understand the executive branch that these presidents were running. And that's the thesis that runs through this book, that modern presidents have gotten so far away from the government that they run that they are more prone to the kind of big failures which really hurt them. Let me read you, I'll read you just a, a two short passages and give you a taste of what's in the book, which I hope you'll buy, okay? Um, let me start with the following. Whenever America gets a new president and vice president, a team of government workers in the General Services Administration is responsible for taking down photos of the outgoing president and vice president and putting up photos of the incoming president and vice president. While the rest of the country is digesting the election results and slowing down for the holidays, this team is working overtime. They must get official photographs taken of the two new leaders, have them reproduced in the thousands, and then make plans to put them up in eight 
8,603 government offices in the United States, approximately 250 embassies and consulates around the world, and between 500 and 1,000 military installations out around the world, depending on how you count them and whether or not, of course, we are at war. This is no small undertaking, as the switch must be accomplished in a short amount of time from just before to just after noon on Inauguration Day. But the symbolism is immense. On the day after Inauguration Day, approximately 2.7 million civilians and 1.5 million military personnel who work for Uncle Sam come to work in their offices. The claims adjuster at the Social Security Office in Rochester, New York, the, the Deputy Chief of Mission in the Embassy in Tirana, Albania, the Forest Ranger at Yellowstone National Park, the Biologist at the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, and the soldier stationed in Stuttgart, Germany, all see the same thing when they arrive. Their new boss. They may not have voted for the new boss, in fact, they may hate him <laughs> and hate his team and everything he stands for, but they know who the boss is. And they have all entered government service knowing that, whether they like it or not, they work for the president. Now let's go over to the White House. On the morning after the inaugural festivities, a tired, and maybe slightly hungover, president and vice president get to work. There are a lot of people around who are new who work for them. Most of them, however, are in uniform. They open the doors, fly the helicopter, man the watch and the guns that sit on top of the White House. What these new employees do not do is actually talk to the president. In fact, on that first morning after the inauguration, the people most likely to talk to the new president are the same ones that have been talking to him for the past two years, his close campaign advisors. There will be some new faces. Each morning, the CIA sends over someone with a briefcase handcuffed to his wrist to present the president's daily brief, the PDF, a compilation of the most sensitive goings-on collected overtly and covertly from around the world by America's spies. Most of these spies are undercover and are probably the only federal employees who don't walk into an office after on the morning after, ele uh, after Inauguration Day and see photos of the new president and vice president. But most of the people the president sees every day will be the same people he saw when he was campaigning. The people the president really doesn't know are the four million or so people who work for him in the executive branch and in the military. And yet, these are the people who will have the responsibility for doing two things, for running the government that the president is now in charge of, and for implementing any new thing that the president wants to do. Most people think that this thing just kind of goes on uh, on its own, and in fact it does. When President Nixon was resigned back in 1974. I was a young graduate student. One of the amazing things was how on the day he was resigning, Social Security checks were being sent out, the mail was being delivered, the guns were being manned at our military installations. In other words, everything was going on without there really being a president there at all. That's what happens in democracies that work on the rule of law as opposed to the rule of men. And yet, in any institution as big as the federal government, you can bet that something is going very right and something's going very wrong at exactly the same time. And the most difficult thing for a president is to figure that out.
Because either way, missing what's going right, missing what's going wrong, can impact the president's own power and his ability, to, or her ability, to get things done. Let me give you an example of that, again from the book. On December 21st, 2013, two Americans, Michael S. Hopkins and Richard A. Mastracchio, detached tubing and electrical connectors from a malfunctioning cooling pump. This may sound very ordinary until you realize that the two Americans were astronauts and the cooling pump they were fixing was part of the International Space Station 240 miles above the Earth. During their five and a half hour spacewalk, they wore suits designed to protect them from the lack of oxygen, the freezing temperatures, and the cosmic dust that makes space a pretty inhospitable place for human beings. Two months before this spacewalk, on October 1st, 2013, millions of Americans in search of subsidized health care logged on to the new federal website, healthcare.gov, hoping to buy insurance as easily as they could buy a plane ticket on Expedia or a book from Amazon.com, or so they thought. Instead, to the dismay of many Americans shopping for health insurance and to the surprise of Barack Obama and his top staff, the website crashed. Not once, not twice, but again and again and again over a period of two long months. The press erupted in a frenzy over the inability of the federal government to build the website at the heart of President Obama's health care plan. They were joined by a polarized citizenry, half of whom wanted to buy health insurance and were endlessly frustrated, and half of whom saw the whole episode as yet more evidence that the government couldn't organize a two-car funeral, which, by the way, is one of Bill Clinton's absolute favorite sayings. I've been hearing him say that for 30 years, and he's still saying it. The pundits pounced opining that the federal government couldn't do technology, that government was hopelessly broken. And yet no one seemed to notice that the technological marvel of men walking in space to repair a space station was accomplished in exactly the same manner in which the healthcare.gov website was built. Federal bureaucrats at NASA contracted with a wide variety of companies, from a little-known company in Massachusetts that made the spacesuits, to Boeing, the aerospace giant that designed and built some of the most sophisticated components of the space station. In another part of the government, the federal employees at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services contracted with information technology companies in the private sector to build the infamous website. The success of the spacewalk passed with little notice, while the failure of healthcare.gov ruined President Obama's Christmas, pushed his approval ratings to new lows, and convinced Americans ready to be convinced that Obama and the government he was in charge of were hopelessly inept. What I'm what I do throughout the book and throughout the stories is show that in each instance there were signs, there was data, there were reports, there were people who knew that the government was broken. There were people who knew that things were going to fail and that there is a way of knowing this for presidents, but presidents have to do really two things in order to get on top of the situation. One is simple, just time. Another famous political scientist who I quote in this book often has shown that over the years, American presidents talk and travel more than they ever did. In fact, they're always talking. There hardly a day goes by when an American president doesn't talk. They don't need to talk this much. And in fact, having been in the White House myself and others in the White House, the senior staff meetings in the morning, all anybody talks about is the message of the day. Oh, the message, get that picture right, get the news right, etc. Well, 
presidents need to start spending a little less time talking and a little bit more time understanding governing and the government that they run. Now, you're thinking, obviously no president can grasp this whole darn thing. I mean, it's just way too big. But they can structure the White House to do what I call scanning. Scanning of the federal government and evaluations of, and I'll take a business term here, organizational capacity. How are these organizations doing? Are they able to do the job they already have? Can they take on a new job? If President Obama or his staff had asked that about the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, they would have found decades, decades of reports saying that this agency was stressed. It was stressed to the breaking point. They were stressed doing the job they already had, which was administering the Medicare program. Adding another whole program onto them was sort of a surefire recipe for disaster. When President Carter ordered the military to conduct a special operations program in um, the deserts in uh, Iran, he, he had a military that for four decades, including most importantly President Eisenhower's watch, had been saying this military is too divided among the branches. They have no ability to fight as one cohesive unit. And sure enough, this was played out in the failed rescue mission. Um, again, four decades of this. President Carter or somebody around him needed to have said, can our military actually do this? By the way, that failure led to a massive military reform movement known as Goldwater-Nichols that took place starting in 1986 and is now a standard operating procedure in the government. And all you have to do is think about the failure of the rescue mission in 1980 and the success of the special ops mission in 2011 that killed Osama bin Laden. That was a redone military from top to bottom. Again, with in President Bush's term, um, let's just take one example, the financial crisis. There were pieces of the US government flashing red lights, saying, ah, these banks are really over leveraged. Uh-oh, there is trouble. There's trouble here. We're doing things that are a little bit crazy. These banks are lending money and building financial instruments on top of a mortgage market that in fact doesn't resemble any of the mortgage markets we've known in the 20th century. Something is going to go wrong. So in each of these things, this was not just out of the blue. There were ways to know. Now, I'm not arguing that we can always, you know, um, forestall all disasters. We can't. Things happen, okay? People miss things all the time. But what I am saying is that it's very important for the health of American democracy that modern presidents pay attention to the government that they run and try to implement their policy better. Thomas Jefferson once said, and I will quote here, um, the execution of the laws is more important than the making of them. Poor execution of, of our laws by modern presidents has meant that Americans have less and less faith in the government that they run. This is a problem not just for liberals who like generally like to see the government do things. It is a problem for conservatives as well. Ever since 1994, we have had a strong conservative presence in one part of our government or another, the House of Representatives, the Senate, sometimes both, the White House since 1994. What has run through every single one of these conservative governments is a desire for a smaller government. Is the government smaller today? Absolutely not. They don't make a dent in it. 
Part of the reason they don't make a dent in this government is they don't understand it. And so they have resorted to across the board cuts time after time. Well, what happens? You do an across the board cut, suddenly there's no air traffic controllers landing planes, suddenly air traffic in the United States grinds to a halt. Oh, everybody gets mad, they go to Congress and they throw the money back in. Sure. Because in fact, to cut the government, I did it in the Clinton administration to a certain extent, to cut the government, you have to cut it in the way that you would cut the fat out of a good piece of steak. Because it's not just in one place, it's marbled throughout the government. But again, you gotta understand what you're cutting before you can cut, otherwise it just backfires on you. So paying attention to this vast thing called the federal government that the, that the new president will encounter is important for developing Americans' trust in government again, and it is important whether you are, have a liberal agenda or you have a conservative agenda. And uh, that's why I wrote the book, and that's why um, I'm very happy to be able to talk to you today about it, and I hope that some of you will read it. Thank you. Questions. We're gonna take a few questions. So, okay, you've got a real expert up here, so you got this. This is a great opportunity. I, <laughs> I, I have a high regard for this woman. She knows her stuff. So, please, good questions. Throw anything you want to at her. She's tough. <laughs> yes, sir. You can wait for the. Let me get you the microphone. It's coming at you right now. I would be interested in the in the use of signing statements when laws are passed and the mm -hmm. president signs the law, but he is this, at the same time issues a signing statement regarding that law, mm -hmm. which could affect how he implements it. Absolutely. And then that and then the truth uh, to people: we have a law, and then you have a signing statement at the same time. That's right. And, and signing statements are important to implementation, but very often, it, again, if the president isn't understanding what he, where he is giving this to, or what agency he's giving this to, um, he can write a signing statement and it doesn't help. So the signing statement is an instrument for him to use, him or her, I gotta start saying, um, it's an instrument for him or her to use in implementation, but it doesn't uh, negate the, the importance of figuring out whether the institutions have the capacity to do the job he's asking them to do. There is so much to be done in, in implementation, because after all, let's face it, for Congress to pass something, especially in a polarized time, they often will gloss over the hard stuff. Right? They'll often just, you know, like give it a pass and ignore it or, or give the most general language possible because that's the only thing they can get people to agree on. And so th there is a lot to be done in implementation. Signing statements are a wonderful vehicle, but they do assume that the president and his people know something about where they're directing implementation to. Yes, Crystal, right here, coming at you. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Crystal C. Mercer. I'm a first year student here at the Clinton School. And my question for you is, do you have some type of analysis for maybe why presidential candidates fail and how they can succeed, particularly this election season? <laughs> um, well, this is part and parcel of the problem, and I do spend some time on this in the book and in a previous book that I wrote called Primary Politics. Let's go back to the old days. The old days is long before you were born, and frankly, even for us 60 plus in this crowd, it was long time before we were born too. But most, for most of American history, we nominated our presidential candidates in conventions. And the conventions were, for all practical purposes, closed entities that were composed of 
party leaders and elected officials. In other words, we nominated Eisenhower, Kennedy, Roosevelt, both Roosevelts, in, in conventions composed only of what we now call superdelegates. That's it. There were no primaries. If there were primaries, they tended to be not meaningful in terms of delegates. Often you had favorite sons running in primaries, which would be the governor or the senator, and they'd just go and control the delegation of the convention. Now, there were a lot of problems with that system, which is why in between 1968 and 1972, there was a massive reform of that. But in reforming that system, we lost one element of the system that actually was pretty important. What the old system did is it allowed for something we call peer review. In other words, you had in the selection of the nominees the judgments of other people who were important in governing. Senators, governors, members of Congress, powerful political mayors, etc. And they would judge the politician seeking the presidency on two dimensions. Can this person win? And is this person able to govern? So I like to run a little thought experiment with this. Uh, Jack Kennedy in 1960 had to convince Governor Lawrence, who was the Democratic governor of Pennsylvania and who controlled all the Pennsylvania delegates, that he could win the presidency even though he was Roman Catholic. To do that, he ran in the, in the West Virginia primary in order to prove that he could win Protestant voters. But he also had to sit down with Governor Lawrence. Now picture this room. Okay, I'm sure there were cigars involved. I'm sure there was brown liquid involved. Um, and imagine the conversation, right? The conversation was about politics, but the conversation was about government too. What's Pennsylvania going to get? What are you going to do with this military base, etc.? Now, let's fast forward and imagine the same system today and imagine a you know, 2016 Governor Lawrence. And imagine Donald Trump walking into that room and saying, I'm going to build a wall and make Mexico pay for it. The modern day Governor Lawrence would say, are you out of your blank, blank mind? <laughs> right? I mean, that's a crazy idea. So what happened in the old system that we lost in the new system is this test, this reality testing, okay, which citizens generally can't do, okay, because this isn't their business, and politicians can do of each other. Um, and so we lost that. So now we nominate politicians who, by and large, are quite eloquent or tap into something, anger, aspiration, whatever it is. For Obama, it was aspiration. For Trump, it's anger. You know, tap into that. But we have no measure, really, of their ability to govern. We have no measure of their pure competence at the job. And, you know, you, a lot of people were disappointed in Obama's, they felt that he underperformed as president. A lot of people very disappointed in George Bush's presidency. People were so disappointed in Jimmy Carter's presidency that they didn't reelect him. Um, you know, we've seen in modern times some real disappointments in the presidency. And we have elected some people who, frankly, would have never, ever gotten through the old system. So that's how the two tie together. This old system, we have lost something when we've gone completely to primaries. Yes, Sissy, here, wait for the microphones coming right there. <laughs> what is your opinion of the press's involvement in primaries today and in the actual um, government of the president? Today, how how is it? in the actual covering of the president, the the governing okay. of governing, um, it's pretty bad. Okay, I mean it's pretty bad now, and part of that is the system that we've evolved to. So we now have to rely on the press to say 
you're crazy, that won't work, that's wrong, etc. And they've been reluctant to do this. In one of the early debates, it was very clear that Donald Trump didn't know what the nuclear triad was. Now, how many people here know what the nuclear triad is? Okay, most people don't, all right? That's no big deal. I mean, ordinary citizens don't need to know that. The nuclear triad is our submarine, ICBM, um, and airborne nuclear defense against a first strike capability. It is the core of our defense and has been for decades. For us to not know that, no big deal. For a possible president of the United States not to know that is absolutely terrifying. But did the reporters say, can you define this for me, Mr. Trump? No. In fact, they helped him along. Okay? They kind of fed it to him. Um, it's, it was the first instance where we saw, uh-oh, something is really wrong here. It's a question of learning curves. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's a question of learning curves in the presidency. One of the reasons that Ronald Reagan was a very effective president is that Ronald Reagan, you know, everybody poo-poos Ronald Reagan as an actor. They always forget he was a two-term governor of the biggest state in the union. He was a two-term governor of a state that's bigger than a lot of countries in the world. Okay, Ronald Reagan knew about government. Okay, he didn't have an enormous learning curve. Bill Clinton was a um, 12 years in the governor in the governorship here in Arkansas, which isn't a very big state, but boy, Bill Clinton was around, as you all know, for a long time. He picked up something. Okay, even so. And I watched Bill Clinton and Al Gore do this. Even so, the presidency is like drinking from a water hose. You have to learn so much, so fast. And most presidents come in with expertise in a couple of places. If you come in with expertise in no places, you're really in trouble. And um, the press has not been able to, and I think it's partially their fault, but also we're, we've also put a lot on them. The press is not doing the job of, you know, calling them on it and figuring out who knows what they're doing and who doesn't. Mr. Craig. You said your premise uh, for the book was that presidents are not spending enough time governing. And the message of the day, your example, is what I guess I would call managing the brand. Mm -hmm. How would then, what would your prescription be for allowing the CEO to actually execute uh, the job while managing mm -hmm. the brand? That's a, that's a great question. I have a little diagram in the book that has policy, communication, and implementation. And the argument, which is a very old argument from, it's really from the business, le, business corporate leadership world, is that the three are sort of equal in importance. In other words, you, you have to take the business analogy, you have to get the right product, you have to communicate and advertise it properly, and you need to make it properly. You can have a great ad campaign for a car, but if the doors fall off, not much of a car, right? So, and it's the same for politics, right? It's the same three things. What I argue is that for modern presidents, the communication piece has gotten bigger than either the policy piece or especially the implementation piece. That once something's done, presidents hand it off, they assume the bureaucracy's going to somehow do it, without having thought through how important implementation is. In the business world, we know that it's not enough to sell the product. The product has to stand the test of time. The car, the doors have to stay on the car, or in a famous example, the dogs like, half you know this example, the dogs need to like the dog food, <laughs> okay? Um, and it's, it's the same here, right? I mean, you can be the most eloquent person in the whole world, and certainly Barack Obama is quite eloquent, but there's no way you talk yourself out of the fact that every time people go on your website, it crashes. 
You just can't talk. Some of these things you just can't talk your way out of. So that's why my argument is not to get rid of communication, but to, but to see the three as equally equal in importance. Yes. Thank you for being with us tonight. It's a very interesting lecture. And in line with what you just said, so if you're going to advise the new president about the communication piece and maybe backing that up a little bit, how does this new administration try to do that with what's expected? And it's a constant news cycle, as you point mm -hmm. out. So how do you not run the risk of trying to appear that you're not forthcoming with the American public when you need to be doing more of what you're saying. What's, what's your advice on that? Um, my advice is that there are, in a constant news cycle, there's constant trivia. Okay? Anybody watch the TV show Veep? Okay. Well, you notice how so much of their comedy stems from the fact that she's trying to negotiate peace in the Middle East and they've got some ridiculous crisis going on that doesn't mean anything to anybody, right? Um, the White Houses get really caught up in this news cycle. And I think one job is to simply let other people do that. You know, let other people do that. Let the, let the, let the smart 32-year-olds who are in the White House, let them monitor that. Give the president space for what really matters. This is, by the way, exactly the sort of thing that they teach at, at the Harvard Business School about executives, right? The, great, the big executives, they, they figure out what matters and focus on what matters. Now, sure, presidents are always going to have the Boy Scouts in, and they're going to always have the winners of the Super Bowl or the World Series come to the White House and have their picture made, et cetera. OK. But just in terms of the time management of the president and the organization of the White House, more time needs to be spent on understanding and anticipating what's going on in the federal government. It's David, right here. They're co the microphone's coming at you. <laughs> There's a recent book that uh, thesis was that President Franklin Roosevelt was very uh, an effective CEO in r running the war. Assuming you agree that that's true, how did he? Well, how was he able to do that? Well, among other things, Franklin Roosevelt had a much smaller government to run. There were fewer cabinet departments. There were fewer employees in, in the federal government. The government just wasn't as big as it is today. But secondly, that was a total mobilization war. I mean, that was every, everybody was drafted, everybody was involved, you know, you had market controls, you, you, had, you had governments telling industries, no, you're not making this anymore, you're making tanks. You know, that was, that was total mobilization. And obviously, he did need to be in the middle of that, and he did, I think everybody thinks, a very good job at that. He was also very good, as we know, at the, at, at the inspirational piece of it, right? He, he understood speaking to the American people, et cetera. And he was a good judge of who to put in charge of things, OK? So remember, Patton was the cool general. Patton was the fighter, right? Patton was the one who was known as the sort of super warrior. Who did Roosevelt put in charge of the invasion of Normandy? Ike, Eisenhower. And why? Because Roosevelt understood that that invasion was going to be a highly political undertaking involving the Allies. Among other things, you had to convince, for instance, the British to do the feint at Calais and not actually be part of the invasion. To, you know, there were all sorts of things that, and that was not easy to convince General Montgomery to do that. And so he, Roosevelt understood personnel wise that he needed a different kind of talent in the invasion of Normandy than Patton would have been. So I think that Roosevelt, what Roosevelt displayed in the war was a really balanced understanding of both communication and implementation. And I think great leaders, whether they're politicians or they're corporate CEOs, are all, always have that balance in mind. 
It's Fiona, right here. Hi there, my name is Fiona O'Leary Sloan and I'm a first year student here at the Clinton School. Um, and one of the things you mentioned early on was how oftentimes, at least in the first days of a new president's tenure, they keep a lot of their campaign staff around, which mm -hmm. seems like it may have something to do with uh, the focus on the daily message that you talked about. And I'm wondering how you would suggest the next president address that staffing challenge and if you think that sort of managing the people that are surrounding them and having it be less related to the campaign could actually cause some of the change you're calling for. Um, my suggestion would be that to sort of take the, the White House structure as we've inherited it and upgrade what has traditionally been known as the Office of Cabinet Affairs. What's happened to modern presidents is that they have the cabinet officers has, have become less important and the White House staff has become more important. And there are layers and layers now in communication between cabinet secretaries and the presidents that they serve. And yet it's the cabinet secretaries who are most likely to know if something's about to blow up um, or if some organization is, is able to do something or if some organization has something important that the president ought to know. So I would build up the Office of Cabinet Affairs, give it specifically the scanning mission, and guarantee that that had daily access to the president. That sort of happens through the National Security Council on the foreign policy side. On the domestic policy side, it doesn't really happen. OMB, which has a lot of this expertise, is so involved in the daily business of budgeting and in macroeconomic management that they don't really do this. They, they're not good advance warning. So the, the function itself needs to be given to some group of people. They can be campaign people. I mean, they can be people who helped in the campaign. It's just that this notion of the perpetual campaign, which a lot of people have written about, is undercutting <coughs> governmental ability. And in the end, governmental ability hurts presidents, not speech making or beautiful pictures. I know there are more questions and we're going to let you ask them individually as you visit with Elaine and she signs her book, Why Presidents Fail. Thank you for coming back. I'm glad you got a tour of the library and it's been great to visit with you and I look forward to having dinner and have more conversations about this in 2016. Let's welcome Elaine to the Clinton School.